Here are 10 music stores that you may or may not remember. Number 10, Sam Goody. Why aren't you with Sam Goody right now? We're from Australia. I'd love to go, but uh, give my boss a call. Well, we're just here for the on vacation. Take a break from high prices at Sam Goody. Hundreds of select titles from Sound Savers are now on sale. Is it that way or that way? And how about you? Why is something on sale? Why are you following me? At Sam Goody, we have lots on sale, and you can even top off your purchase with savings from 800 flowers. I can make time for that. Okay, so now what do you think? Don't you know it's all right? Goody got it. On sale now through February 14th. Sam Goody dominated the music marketplace during the 1980s and the 1990s. But what you may not know is Sam Goody was a real guy. Samuel Goody Goodowitz was a toy and novelty store owner in the 1930s. But it was when one customer came in looking for old records that Goody realized he was in the wrong business. He found an old pile of records in his apartment building and gave his landlord a can of beer in exchange for it. He ended up reselling those records for $25. Now, by 1955, Sam Goody's stores were booming, and his flagship store on West 49th Street had up to 4,000 customers per day, and the sales accounted for 7% of U.S. record sales. There was reason for this. Sam Goody's stores had incredibly knowledgeable staff members. They would need to basically have an encyclopedia of knowledge of all things music. From opera to punk, not only was the staff incredibly knowledgeable, but the prices were so low that they rocked the competition. But in 1978, with fears of his sons breaking the company apart, he decided to sell for just $5.5 million. Number nine, licorice pizza. He just couldn't wait, so he hired me to find out what his wife was giving him for Christmas. He turned out to be one lucky guy. Camouflage by Rod Stewart. Some guys have all the luck. Chicago 17, Breaking Hearts by Elton John, and Like a Virgin by Madonna. I know a good idea when I hear one. This Christmas, I'm giving music. Prince's Purple Rain. It's going to be a very purple Christmas. On sale at Licorice Pizza for $6.99 on LP or cassette. As you will see in this video, for some reason, record stores love naming themselves after food. But this one really strikes me as a strange one until you break down what it really means. Then it's fantastic. Licorice Pizza was a Los Angeles-based record store chain. Sounds like a hipster food joint until you think that a record kind of does resemble a physical licorice pizza. Now, you may have heard this name more recently as the chain inspired the title of the Paul Thomas Anderson's 2021 film with the same name. Licorice Pizza was first opened by James Greenwood in July of 1969 in downtown Long Beach. Now, he named the store this because he heard it describing a record and thought it sounded better than Jim's records. Within the next 15 years, multiple locations spread throughout Southern California. They became known for their highly knowledgeable staff getting new releases first and giving away free licorice. You can even see a licorice pizza store in Ridgemont Mall in the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Even the Simpsons creator himself, Matt Growing, worked at Licorice Pizza. He said all the rock stars of the day would come into the store because in addition to records, they also sold paraphernalia. Licorice Pizza was sold in 1986, and you'll find out to whom later in this video. Number eight, Record Bar. This week at all Record Bar outlets, a new dimension of sight and sound. Scotch EG all-purpose video cassettes L750 or T120, only $4.99. Scotch EXG video cassettes unsurpassed color L750 or T120, only $7.99. Scotch Video Head Cleaner, the sure way to clean VCR heads, beta or VHS, only $14.99. On sale now at all Record Bar outlets. The Record Bar was a single record store founded in the 1950s. In 1960, Harry and Bertha Bergman purchased that single record store that was 800 square feet in Durham, later opening its second location in downtown Chapel Hill in an old Musicland building. Over the next 20 years, the record bar would open a total of 180 stores, primarily in southeastern U.S. Now, they even began opening superstores under the name Trax to compete with larger standing stores like Peaches and Tower. Now, in the early 1990s, record bar would be sold to none other than Blockbuster Video. It's kind of small. I mean, it's cute. 
so little. Need to increase your music collection? Sorry. Blockbuster would rebrand these stores as Blockbuster Music Stores, ending the record bar chain name. Blockbuster Music Stores really didn't stick around that long, even though they had at one time 378 stores in 33 states. They may have had a grasp on the video rental business, at least for the time being, but not the music business. The chain was sold to warehouse record stores and were converted over by mid-1999. Number 7. Strawberries. This Rhode Island and Massachusetts-based record chain was New England's best record store for over a decade. You could also go to Strawberries to pick up tickets for upcoming concerts. Now, this wasn't just a record store with a cute name, it actually had ties to the mob. Federal authorities were describing you yesterday as the godfather of the American music business, the connection between the mob and the music business. What do you say to that? There is no connection between the mob and the music business. At all? I don't believe so. You were indicted yesterday on three of the 117 counts. The indictment says essentially that you and a New Jersey mafia figure, Corky Vastola, uh, arranged to have somebody beat up because they owed more than a million dollars to the big record company MCA. What about these charges? They're not true. Strawberries was opened and owned by Morris Levy. Morris Levy was also the owner of the Birdland Jazz Club in Manhattan and the president of the Roulette Records label. Once the internet boom of the late 90s started, Strawberries would struggle to stay relevant, and most of their stores would be empty for the majority of the day. Number 6. Camelot Music So, you're buying CDs as a gift for your girlfriend. Now, did she say Black Crows, Counting Crows, or Cheryl Crow? New Wave, New Age, New Kids on the Block, OMD, REM, Ecstasy, White Zombie, Great White, Berry White, Berry, White, Berry Man, Los Kilo, Live Bird, Double Up, Unplugged, Best Box, Beastie Boys, Boys, Beastie Boys, The Men. And you think they're going to help you at a store that sells microwaves? If you need help, Camelot Music has the experts. Camelot Music. No one knows music better. Paul David established Camelot Music in 1956 in Mason, Ohio, under the name of Stark Record and Tape Service. The company started as a rack jobber, which stocked records in various drug, specialty, and grocery stores. A rack jobber operates by placing racks of products in stores. Nine years later, the company opened its first retail store in Canton, Ohio. Camelot Music stores were located mainly in the Midwest and Southeast. Now, Camelot Records was one of the third largest music specialty retailers in the country. Camelot Records even joined the late 90s internet boom with a website called CD Genie. CD Genie would allow users to listen to 30 second sound bites from several hundred current releases and order the discs online. Prices were the same as in store plus shipping, but to counter those costs, CD Genie offered free subscriptions to Rolling Stone or Spin Magazine after making a small number of purchases. By mid 1998, Camelot operated 455 stores in 37 states nationwide under two brand names. Camelot Music branded 305 stores, and The Wall branded the other 150. The Wall was best known for their trademark Lifetime Music Guarantee, which offered free replacements for cassettes and CDs that have been damaged in any way. They are also well known for being able to open a CD without breaking the label and would allow customers to sample new music in just that way. Camelot would acquire one other store called Spec Music out of Florida, putting their store count to almost 500. But in late 1998, at the peak of their business, Camelot Music and The Wall were sold. Number five, Peaches. The best browsing, biggest selection of compact discs, albums, cassettes, videos, and more. That's Peaches. Hundreds of artists to choose from. Aerosmith, Bob Dylan, Gloria Estefan, Journey, James Taylor, LL Cool J, Pink Floyd, Sade, Neil Diamond, Roy Orbison, Richard Claterman, Julio Iglesias, B.B. Snow, Barbara Streisand, plus more. Peaches, a lot of music, a lot of stores. Peaches was a Los Angeles-based record store chain that was founded in 1963 by Tom Hyman. Peaches was best known for a vast selection of records and their stores being the size of a grocery store. They even had theme stores with a produce stand approach, selling records out of crates with the company's colorful fruit-style logo on the side. 
Peaches was also well known for their autograph events, as well as the huge reproduction of album covers of the latest releases on the side of its buildings. And outside the stores, you would also typically find artist prints in the cement sidewalks. Peaches would eventually branch out, no pun intended, to Atlanta in 1975 and Chicago in 1980. Now, all the LA, Chicago, and Atlanta stores would close over the years, but there's actually one remaining Peaches store located in a former Woolworth store in the New Orleans, Louisiana area. They even continue to maintain the Woolworth lunch counter to this very day. The lone remaining Peaches actually has been voted the fourth best record store in the entire world. Number four. Record World. Opened in New York around 1959, this record store eventually expanded to DC, Virginia, and Sawgrass Mills, Florida. The store chain was operated by Elroy Distributors in 1978, and by 1980, Record World had a total of 32 stores. They even opened and expanded the company's warehouse in Freeport, New York from 15,000 square feet all the way up to 20,000 square feet. The chain was involved in a one-sided single campaign by CBS Records. In fact, the chain was given gold album plaques for the hit Pointer Sisters album, Breakout. By the mid 1980s, the chain continued to expand, having a total of 66 stores by 1986. Things looked bright, but took a turn for the worst in 1989, where many record world stores would close. By 1990, the chain was completely defunct. Now this was due to TSS filing for bankruptcy. Now at that point, TSS owned Record World, but all of those locations would then be acquired by MCD Records and Tapes in 1992. Record World was then purchased by WH Smith, who would later rebrand Record World as The Wall. Although The Wall didn't have as cool of decor as Record World, because that stuff is wild. Now, you may have never heard about Record World, and I really wanted to include this one in this video because I put a post out not too long ago showing the project we were working on, which is this video right here. And I thought the pictures that still existed for Record World were wild. Like, it looks so retro. I mean, just look, this store was definitely the total package. Number three. Tower Records. Take a ride to Tower Records! It's a real trip! Thousands of CDs are on sale now! For just $12.99, save on space! Also $12.99, docking! Only $11.99, the brand new US 3! And Grammy winner, Beth! Tower. The beloved Towered Records chain was more than just another record store. At its peak in the late 1990s, Tower Records had over 200 stores in 15 countries, before the rise of digital music and the internet. Tower Records was a store that not just sold vinyl, but books, magazines, videos, and even concert tickets. Not only that, but they also had concerts live at the stores from big name artists. One really great thing about Tower Records is every store was different and the employees and management dictated the environment, making each store its own community of sorts. The Los Angeles store, for example, had frequent visits from some of the music industry's biggest stars, and Tower Records was a place where many future celebrities would land one of their first jobs. David Grohl said in a 2015 interview with Noisy that he got a job in Tower Records in DC because that's the only place he could get a job with his freaking haircut. Axl Rose also worked at a Tower Records affiliate called Tower Video in LA before becoming a rock star, and Axl wasn't the only member member of Guns N' Roses to work at Tower, Slash also held a job at Tower Records Sunset Boulevard even after being caught shoplifting at the same store years earlier. That Sunset Strip Tower Records location was a famous one for sure. It had more concerts and autograph sessions than any other store, including the likes of Elton John, Tom Petty, The Doors, Mariah Carey, and even David Hasselhoff. Now that sounds like a scene right out of Empire Records, if you ask me. 
you never know what's going to be happening when you stopped in a Tower Records, and many people would frequent multiple times a week. But in 2006, Tower Records filed for bankruptcy, and the most star-studded record chain of all time faded into the past. Number two, Music Land. Music Land. We've got your music at Music Land. Pick up the latest hit releases from Power Station, Go West, Dan Fogelberg, Rick Springfield, Kenny Rogers, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and Brian Adams. Just $5.99 each cassette or LP. Music Land. We bring entertainment to life. The first Music Land store was opened in 1955 in Minneapolis. By 1963, Music Land had grown to six stores, and by that time, the original owners decided to sell their interest in the company. Although there's not a ton of info available on the original Music Land chain, they did play a vital part in the music store industry. Now, Music Land became a holdings group purchased by Sam Goody in 1978. Then in 1986, they opened the first ever Suncoast Motion Picture Company store originally named Paramount Pictures. The name changed to Suncoast wouldn't come until 1988. They then opened Media Play in 1992, which is a chain of retail superstores basically operating as a bookstore, movie store, video game store, and music store all in one. But in 2001, Music Land would be purchased by Best Buy. Now this would be a failed concept for the big box retailers. They didn't understand the mall store concept. They would go on to lose $85 million in 2002 and would sell to Sun Capital. And in 2006, they'd be resold to Transworld Entertainment. Now this is where things kind of get interesting and it also leads into our number one store on the list. So Transworld Entertainment actually owns several other now defunct music and entertainment stores, including Camelot Music, CD World, Disc Jockey, Incredible Universe, Leopold's, Media Play, Music World, On Cue, Planet Music, Peaches, Record and Tape Traders, Record Factory, Record Land, Record Town, Record World, Saturday Matinee, Specs Music, Spin Street, Squared Circle, Strawberries, Street Side Records, Tape World, Vibrations, the Wall, Wall-to-Wall -wall Sound, and Warehouse Entertainment. The remaining non-defunct company were sold off to Sunrise Records in 2020, and this included the remaining Coconuts in Evansville, Indiana, Sam Goody in St. Clarksville, Ohio, and Medford, Oregon, Specs Music in San Juan, Puerto Rico, Manifest Discs and Tapes in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the remaining Suncoast in Beaumont, Texas, Eatontown, New Jersey, Omaha, Nebraska, and Portland, Oregon. And most importantly, they became the only remaining nationwide music store. Number one, FYE. FYE, or For Your Entertainment, is the last remaining American mall retail music store. In some way, every FYE is really that now defunct mall store chain that you remember from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, just rebranded as an FYE store. Even though it's now owned by Sunrise Records out of Canada, FYE remains in several malls around the US approximately 200 stores as of this recording. So if you want to get that experience you remember from the booming mall days, you should check one out because there's a good chance malls in general will be fading and becoming defunct in the years to come. Now that being said, FYE stores may not feel as special as they once did and may have more of a corporate feel, but every store will be a little different. I would suggest if you really want to experience a unique store as you did in the past, you should check out your local record store. There's probably several in your area that all have different fields. 
I got to experience this firsthand when I toured the majority of record stores in Nashville and Chicago in a previous series we did on the channel, and you can check that out right there. And also, make sure to share your stories and experiences, past or present, of any type of music or media story you remember in the comments of this video.